All right, we've hit the uh, the noon mark, at least here in Eastern Zone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Jackson Jackson Show. I'm your host, Scott Cohen, founder, CEO, Greg Harmon here with me, co-founder, CTO, and Brad Hatch, our principal data scientist who will take the floor momentarily and run us through data augmentation. Just wanted to start out by sharing that our goal as a company is to eliminate as much of the human, or at least the rote manual work around uh, data labeling and creating training data for machine learning models as possible. Uh, we've breathed in automation to a number of the steps from active learning to concepts around weak supervision and generative modeling uh, to what we're going to highlight today, data augmentation. Uh, when we talk about data augmentation, we're trying to um, add in the capabilities to both generalize and help the training set cover the edge cases or the, the manifolds of the neural net. With that, let me turn it over to our expert, Brad. All righty, so kind of the general, uh, I get it's not really a story arc, but the, the general progression of this, what is data augmentation? Why do we need it? Uh, and what does it look like in images and why is that easy and what does it look like in text and why is that hard and then uh, so st starting out with what is data augmentation the main point behind this slide is deep learning needs a lot of data and sometimes what we have available is not enough even if it's even if it's a million examples and so what data augmentation does is it it uh, it creates a larger data set and and a more diverse data set uh, by generating extra examples based on what you already have and this can be done through two two general methods one is just somebody writes a function that takes an example and alters it a little bit like, uh, uh, I'm gonna just rotate the image a little bit and that creates a new example for the model to learn from. The second way is for the, to have a second model learn all the characteristics of what data you have and then try to mimic it by generating similar type of examples. Uh, as you can imagine, the latter is, is, is a much more difficult task. Um, than, than just writing a, a, a quick function to take one example and turn it into another. Yeah, in essence, the second the second way is the GANs and the first way is just like Photoshop techniques, right? Yeah, yeah. PyTorch comes with a slew of first first uh, first examples, first method. Um, so let's first let's talk about uh, image augmentation. And these are just simple functions that take one example, like this picture of this cat here, as the, that's the original image, but we can create new examples by just altering that original image a little bit. The first one is a rotation. The second one, if you can notice, we, we flipped it. Um, the tail is now on the other side. Uh, the third one is, is grayscale. We can enlarge it and then crop it so it's still the same size, and then we can uh, finally, at the end, we can adjust the color hues, the brightness, and the contrast. And each of these is a brand new example to the model. The model has never seen these examples before because certain things are in different places or they're different colors. All right, I'm so, going to up the flow. Now I'm curious. So in Photoshop, which I played around with, I know there are so many different options. How do you decide which ones to do and how, how many to do? Like if um, there's like a one, like if there's only a, a small variant on say hue, are you going to do every notch of the settings within Photoshop or are you going to do like every 10? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, there's some, there's some you probably want to steer away from like 
notice the second one was flipped on a vertical axis. So it, what was on the left now becomes on the right. You probably don't want to flip it on the horizontal axis because that's not indicative of a real world example to have an upside down cat. Sure. And so you, um, but usually uh, there's, a, there's a standard set of augmentations and PyTorch and TensorFlow have those already programmed in. So you don't need to use Photoshop they, this happens during training. That's for, for like, say, twisting the image, right? Yeah. Let me ask that question. So, say so you had, I guess you don't have 360, you have like 180 degrees to turn the image. Do you do a click on every degree? No, it randomly will select a degree between like zero and 45. One through zero, zero through 45, it wouldn't be like three or four in that range. It's chunked up in 45 segments. So every time this original image is presented to the model, you can do a random transformation to it. Random. Yep. Random it's just, so you randomly select to rotate it, and then you randomly select to rotate that by anywhere between one and 45 degrees or 90 degrees or 180 degrees, somewhere in there. So. So the amount uh, of different combinations of these augmentations, you can combine these augmentations as well. Right. So that answers my questions about hue. You wouldn't do every click. You would do two or three per image. Yeah, you'd give right. it, um, yeah. You would do each, each option separately. Like you do two or three variants on contrast, two or three variants on saturation, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It, it, and it, so you, what you do is if you had a list of 10 different ways to augment, uh, to, to augment this image, like hue, rotate, flip, you could, and, and you, you decide, you could, you could randomly select three. And then within those three, there's usually a, ra a range that you can randomly select from. This is through PyTorch? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and TensorFlow and any, any deep learning library. Right. But presumably the sky's the limit if we wanted to do this outside of PyTorch. That's right, yep. Okay, I'm curious now about um, some of the other features in Photoshop, like shadow. Is that something that is done? Um, usually no, because uh, you mean add shadows to, like to the cat, like yeah. have the cat have shadows? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it depends on, a lot of it is, uh, determined by computation time. If it takes, if it doesn't take very much time to add a shadow, then maybe. But if you if you're just looking for cats in an image, then a shadow might not help you find the cat. True. That's true. No. Okay. Great question, though. So the so the the, the pros of these type of image augmentation is they're simple and they're fast and they give a lot of variety. Uh, to the model. One of the cons is that it is, it is limited by what is in the data set. So it can't imagine stuff that's not in the data set. Got it. Uh, but recent strides in, in teaching a model how to generate data has come, uh, come a long way. These used to just be blobs with eyeballs uh, a, a, as pictures. But this was this is from actually a paper that just came out earlier this month, and uh, and it was trained on data, uh, a celebrity faces data set, and uh, it, it can generate these are generated images, and uh, and so and they're very crisp the the faces are very symmetric, which is which was also a problem early in the days, um, but you can see that the model can learn the distribution and the different features and the characteristics of the data in order to generate its own. And now it's generating, these data samples exist nowhere. It just, it just dreamt them up and created them. Uh, and if, if uh, so th this, this is from a model that came out earlier this month. There's another, there's a website called, um, can you see my, can you see that on my screen? Yeah. This person the, the, not exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this person does not exist.com. And every time you refresh the page, it generates an, another image of a, of a person that does not exist in the world. But they're very, like the details of it are very, very, very fine. Yeah, that's cool. And, and sometimes you get these, these artifacts 
you, sometimes you'll see them in the ears, sometimes you'll see them in the glasses or on the teeth, but actually these are, these are not too bad. And the background is just usually fuzzy. Uh, there's kind of a weird earlobe. Actually, these are pretty good. But, uh, but this is a, just a website. Every time you refresh the page, it creates another. Her earrings are off. She had two different earrings. Yeah. And this one kind of has an earring. Anyway. But you yeah. Can, I guess. But it even gets like the older features and even the, the, the light. I think, I think this is a really cool, um, really yeah. cool website. That is pretty cool. Uh, the pros of this is that um, uh, really. They, just to, out of curiosity, are they taking like actual features from other people and just like merging them together? Nope. They, it is completely from scratch. Completely from scratch. So you give it random numbers and it turns those random numbers into a face. And so every time you give it a new random numbers, it's. It, it, if, even if you just alter one of those, uh, one of those numbers. What's your random number? Oh, I, that's a good question. That'd be that'd be kind of cool to see what my random to generate someone as close as possible to me. Yeah. So how is uh, he? How is it able to? I mean, you said this random number. How is it able to generate like a nose that isn't, I don't know, huge, for example, or like generate a third ear or stuff like that, like. Yeah, so that, that kind of gets into the mechanics of what it's trying to do because it is uh, this particular, it, it depends on the model, but it, it, the architecture of the model is such that you just feed it a bunch of pictures of celebrity faces mm -hmm. and it can learn what features go together. And uh, uh, again, at the beginning, at the early stages of, of, of these things, like in early stages, this is like four years ago, uh, four or five years ago, it, they, were, they were just blobs. Sometimes the people had five eyeballs, uh, but just through the mechanics of the architecture, they've set up the model to really be able to extract what makes up a face. I see. But it, it does it. It learns it all on its own. That's the that's the most incredible. That's the cool thing about deep learning is that you give it the info, you give it the data, and it will learn it by itself. What is important, you don't have to tell it. Yeah. So the pros of this, uh, it's like a cool thing to show your friends, to generate images because it just generates random images, uh, but it can also nicely warm up your model before you try to do a. Uh, a supervised task. So this is this is also a form of pre-training. But it's really to be to be quite frank, it's really not that useful image generation, because what you want, which is in the next slide here, what you want is to be able to generate an image according to a class that is in your data. That is much more useful for for training. So this is a uh, this just comes from uh, a recent paper, but but uh, as you can see. You can tell it generate me a generate a picture of a fireplace, and it will generate some images of a fireplace that are beyond what's in the data set. Now the watches get kind of uh, get kind of funky, and so so when we're generating images according to a certain class or a certain label that we have in our data set. Uh, that becomes much more valuable to us if we're if for a supervised training test. So if we have a, if we're trying to classify images and we don't have a lot of pictures of fireplaces, we can generate those images. Um, and uh, again, so one of the biggest pros to this is that it is generating images that are uh, beyond what's in the data set. And so you can add all the all the functional augmentations, the rotating, the resizing and cropping to these generated images as well. And typically, uh, we want to generate images when we don't have a lot in our data set. And we just need, like for, uh, rare, for medical images, if there's a rare disease uh, uh, that, that are on microscopic slides, uh, slide images, then we probably want to generate stuff that looks like that, depending on, the, on the, what is normal and what is uh, not normal tissue. So the that's so far we've only talked about how to augment images and 
quite frankly, augmenting images is a much easier task than, than augmenting text. And the reason behind that is, is, is that is, is in, the, in the data structures of each of those types of data. So an image, if we look at the cat, the image is, is made up of pixel values, usually uh, red, green, blue pixel values, but we have these continuous and we treat them as continuous values. Uh, so if we, if, if, if we added one to every single value, pixel value in this cat image, it probably wouldn't change the structure of that image very much. Or if, I, if we just added one to a ran, one random pixel, um, it, it, that adding one to a ran, just one random pixel would be in pers uh, we wouldn't be able to, to see that both, both human and machine wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But when we move over to text, text is what we call discrete data. And text, every, uh, every word is its own category. So if we have this sentence, this, this cupcake is crazy delicious, this is how we would re represent it where the word this is represented by this second position out of all the words. And cupcake is represented by this position. And so it looks like this. And if we added if we had the, 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 the sentence, the weather is nice today, and we added one to, to that data, it would shift all of, the, all, of, all of that data by one. And the output would be comma property, his winner's child. And so just adding, adding one to discrete data drastically changes everything, while adding one to continuous data in this range from zero to 255, uh, hardly changes the structure of the data. And so we have to be very careful with how we, and, and, and these, these, these tools and these models for generating images all deal with generating continuous, um, continuous data. And, uh, and so, so the, trying to translate those models, take those models and apply them to text is, is is a, is a big gap to cross. Um, but a lot of strides have been made in generating text. And what, what happens is that these text models, these language models, they learn from millions and millions and sometimes billions of examples just to know how to structure language. And, uh, and when, they, when they're called upon to generate text, they need a prompt. So this actually comes, this, this prompt here, the prompt is this cupcake is, and we give that to the, to the model that's learned from just piles and piles of text data. And, and we ask it to just generate something that completes that thought, this cupcake is. And this text was actually generated from one of the Jackson models. And, uh, and, it, and it generated, this cupcake is an expensive, ingenious way to forget American life, everyday life. The campaign usually concerns or controversy. So it, you can see that the fluidity is, is there. Maybe it's not totally accurate, especially with that second sentence. But uh, and you can also get a flavor of what kind of data this was trained on. This was actually trained on general Wikipedia data, and so so it's not gonna. It, it, it doesn't know much about cupcakes or, um, but it kind of fitted in. Uh, um, it, when, it, when it tried to complete, complete the prompt that we gave it, this cupcake is. And so we, we, can, we, can, generate, we can generate text uh, and, 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 and having it make sense throughout the entire generated text and making that text long. Here's just a, like 20 words. But trying to make this a long form text is even harder. Um, but Again, this is not guided. We're not telling it to generate anything as uh, it, to pertaining to a, a particular class. We're not saying generate a positive sounding statement starting with this cupcake is. It's just generating what it feels like. And it'll generate something different every time. So when it comes to text augmentation, right now, uh, to be honest, it's a lot of hacks, a lot of a lot of a lot of interesting. We're gonna we're, we're sticking mostly with the with the um, with the writing functions to make a new to make a new uh, to make a new example. 
And we can change a sentence. So if we have this example sentence here, this was a great movie, we can change this sentence uh, on, on a word level or, and also on a sentence level. On a word level, we're just replacing certain words in the sentence. And one, there, there's, there's several techniques for this. One is just random word replacement. So we just randomly take a few words and replace them with other random words in our vocabulary. Uh, and this first one, uh, potato, it, it turned this was a great movie into potato was a great tuberculosis, which is also a shout out to Seinfeld, uh, an episode in Seinfeld. But, but that one, that one you, you, you can drastically change the meaning of the word or of the sentence. Another way of doing this is TFIDF word replacement, where you, it's like random word replacement, but we take it one step farther and we only replace the most frequent words in our corpus, uh, which is things like this was a movie might not be as common, but we replace the most frequent words in our, in our corpus with other very frequent words. So it kind of preserves a little bit more of the context, even though this one read, now reads, of was in great movie. Another is just uh, to replace some, uh, some, some nouns and adjectives with other na similar nouns and adjectives. This was a good film. But we can also do it on a sentence level. And these are usually more computationally expensive methods. For example, back translation. You take the sentence, this was a great movie. We translate it into German. And then we take the German translation and translate it back into English. And depending on the language that you use, it can really drastically change the word order but going from one language, translating to a second language, going, translating back to the first, usually produces a different sentence. And you can, you can actually enforce it too. You can make it give a little more diversity. Usually at the, the expense of fluidity, um, but it could change that this was a great movie into the movie was excellent. And now we have a totally different sentence structure. Uh, there's also ways of combining you can turn an entire sentence into one vector of numbers and take another sentence that's very similar, turn it into another vector of numbers and then just add them together or take the average or weight one 70% and one 30% and then add them together. And that should uh, create another sentence representation that is the combination of the, the other two. Um, Empirically, have you found one language better to use than another for back translation? Uh, it, I haven't, no. In some of the papers they use, I think they use French. Okay. Just curious if there's one that changes it up too much or not enough and there's a no. This would be interesting to see if you could do it with two languages, do it with French and German and get two different augmentations out of it. Yeah, for sure or even like French and Korean. Yeah, and so there's, there's all these different ways, but they're really, we're, we're really not, uh, it's still a very hard task to have a model look at a, at a corpus of text, learn language, but also learn the classes that those belong to. Because, and we can, we can there are some workarounds, instead of using discrete values, as your inputs for words, you can use word embeddings, but even word embeddings are just an approximation to the true value of a uh, true representation of a word. Just like, uh, um, uh, uh, because something like word to vec is also trained on some other corpus that may not have uh, anything, the context of that corpus may not have anything to do with the data that you have on hand. And so there's still this, this, this bridge to gap um, instead of using discrete representations, you can use word to vec, which is a continuous representation. But it's still not exact representation of the of a word. Interesting. Um, I didn't know that. I didn't know this. Word to vec was trained on the Google News vocab. Yeah, and you can train your own word to vec on on your own data. Yeah, we do. Yeah, every topic model we create in the classical tab is a custom trained word to vec. 
That's right. That's right. Um, and then one fast text. Do we do custom training for fast text as well? Is that yes. for me or Greg? Greg. Yeah, same deal. Okay. But Not since we're on the topic, we can also import pre-trained uh, word to vec embeddings into our neural models, uh, which is which is was something that we had added to uh, support Korean. Oh, that's right. It's hard to find a fully pre-trained Korean model. Might as well have part of one. Very good. All right. Thanks. Carry on. And then uh, finally, in, in Jackson, one way that, that, uh, that we used data augmentation is uh, we use it in conjunction with supervised learning. So you have a and, and we, we use this when we have a small amount of labeled data and, a, and just piles of unlabeled data. That is a great scenario to use uh, some, some data augmentation. But how, how, how Jackson uses it is that in the, in the, in the purple there is just the, the normal classification process where you have labeled data, it goes into a model, the model makes a prediction, and then it learns with, in regards to how right or wrong it got that prediction. But what, uh, what we add is, a, uh, is an auxiliary uh, step. And while the supervised learning in purple is going on, uh, the, in, the blue, in the blue box um, is this, we're, we're trying to utilize the unlabeled data. And how, and how we do that is we, we create, we take an unlabeled example and we create an augmented copy of it using one of the ones that we just described in the, uh, in the slide before. And for example, just random word replacement. We replace a few of the words in the unlabeled original example and create it's a, a pair that's been augmented with a few switches. We place both of those, both of those go into the model and the model makes a prediction on both of those examples. And the point of this is not to get the prediction right because it's unlabeled, even the augmented a clone or copy of it is unlabeled. And so we don't know what the true label is, but we want the model to be consistent in its predictions. And so whatever it predicts for the unlabeled example, we want it to predict the same thing for its, it, its augmented counterpart. And that's called consistency learning. And, 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 uh, and so we have these two things going on at the same time while the model is training. And, and, and it turns out that this is a very powerful tool because even though you have a very few examples labeled, the model is learning how to classify those correctly, but even slight variations of what you have are gonna be classified into the same thing. And sometimes we make drastic variations. We create a really augmented, a, a, a heavily augmented example from a, a piece of unlabeled data. And we say, you need to predict these two things the same. And in doing so, one example can have a lot of variation and still be classified into the same, into the same category. And so it, it, it can take a lot, it can take a, a small amount of labeled data and really, really generalize well from it. Very good. Well, I didn't wanna interrupt you there, but I know we're, we're past the half hour mark. Um, we do have a few extra minutes if anyone has any questions. If not, then please feel free to reach out to us directly. You can um, email jackson at jackson.ai. And I hope you enjoyed this webinar and learned something from it. Brad, that was awesome. I, I really appreciate you, you sharing all of that wisdom. Um, and for clarity, we have this uh, baked into the Jackson platform. And if you're interested in seeing a demo, then let us know. All right, thanks everyone, take care.